Welcome to Northport Community United Church of Christ. No matter who you are or where you are in life's journey, you're always welcome here. And I do mean that you're always welcome here. If you have the cell phones, would you mind please silence them or turning them off? Uh, if you have the, haven't done so, the, the red attendance books at the end, could you sign them and pass them on? Please check the bulletin for activities this week, and there is a deacon's meeting on Monday, 6.30, 6.30. There is going to be a congregational meeting after church, so if you are a member, please stay seated. Anybody that's a visitor or guest can go and have refreshments, but we have to have a congregational meeting after service. Oh. Who's that? I heard something. <laughs> oh, it's so back here. Uh, the October newsletter are printed and pick them up in the back of uh, the uh, copies today. Tickets on sale for the dinner for October 29th following the newbies, movies. See Patty and or Ed Bogert for tickets. Pastor Attila will be away for a few weeks, please. Call the church office if you have any pastoral care needs. There will be no phone in for prayers, Bible study for the next three weeks. Please see the insert and bulletin this morning for a new member inquiry class. Pastor Till will be holding the meeting on November the 6th. Women's breakfast will be held Wednesday. October the 12th at Perkins. What time? 8.30. 8.30. Be there. Be square. Sign up in Fellowship Hall. Okay. <clears throat> I'm happy to welcome today Ray Rogers and Joe Del 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 Deleuze. Close? Okay. From the Gideons International who will provide a message today. Okay, Patty. It's, it's you. The pumpkin patch. <clears throat> you spoiled the surprise. Yes, I'm here to talk about pumpkins again. I hope you noticed when you drove up our pumpkin patch is here. And I would just like everyone who was here yesterday to help unload the truck to please stand. If you can. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to say it was a little bit hectic um, when the truck, first of all, everybody usually expects trucks to arrive late. Ours arrived 40 minutes early, so the only ones here at the time were Patty Boger and her son and myself, Allison, and the baby. Um, so it was a little bit hectic and chaotic when they, when they arrived, but I got on my cell phone and I called everybody who's in my speed dial and, and you got here and it was great. We didn't do it quite the way we wanted to, but we got them unloaded and um, we have 432 of the big pumpkins and 160 of the little, little bitty ones and tons of gourds and, and things like that. Um, I just want to take an opportunity to remind you that the purpose of the pumpkin patch is to provide funds to make Pastor Till a full time. It's been our goal for the past year and a half to be able to make him full time. And when we did our stewardship campaign in the springtime, we realized we couldn't make him full time in May, but we thought with special efforts such as the pumpkin patch that we could probably make him full time November 1st. That's 23 days from now or 24 days, because Pumpkin Patch is gonna run for 23 days. So it's really, the, the purpose of the Pumpkin Patch is really for an amazing purpose. Um, so the chart to sign up to volunteer to help, give us two hours. Um, sit out there, visit with a fellow church member, and sell some pumpkins. It's really not gonna be that hard, um, but if we keep in mind the purpose is to be able to make Pastor Attila full-time, which he will be November 1st, and to be able to continue to have the funds to do so. Um, so keep in mind our goal, and please volunteer. Thank you. Yes. She's done, she's done a great job with this. 
Okay, are there any other announcements? Last minute reminder, today is the last day to sign up for your October appointment for the pictorial directory. I will be up there by the chair, by the baptismal font right after the congregational meeting. And um, if you want a directory, you need to sign up either now or February and January and February, which is when we have the next set. So thank you. Good morning. Um, as Dave mentioned, I will have tickets on sale for the chicken dinner after the movie in Fellowship Hall after the meeting. Um, we're going to have, Ed's going to prepare the dinner, baked chicken, potato, vegetable, roll, salad, and dessert. So I have no idea what he has planned for dessert, so it will be a surprise. And she's had to be nice to Ed for the past month. Yeah. <laughs> Do we have any first time visitors? Okay, then everybody knows the routine. Uh, let us have the kids come up for. Uh, it will be the noisy coins for breakfast with Santa. Let us be at worship.
our strongest allegiance is to Christ, who gives us unity with each other. Please stand, if you are able, and join in the singing of our opening hymn, We Are One in the Spirit. Good morning. I am here um, to talk about Operation Christmas Child. Um, Operation Christmas Child is a wonderful um, <coughs> opportunity for us to do Christmas shopping for children in another country um, who does not know about Christ and does not know about Christmas and the joys that come because of, because of Christmas. So Operation Christmas Child is sponsored and created by Samaritan Purse. The idea came to us actually from the dolls, Jeannie and Larry Doll. They brought it to our attention um, last year and Christian Ed um, participated with the youth group and with the Sunday school children and some other church members participated as well last year. And it was such a wonderful experience shopping for these children. And you don't have to get expensive stuff because these kids don't have much and they just would like anything. And to also give them school supplies because some of them don't have school supplies that they need. So you think about different stuff that they need just to bring joy because isn't Christmas about bringing joy to children and to others? So Operation Christmas Child was a fun experience that we did last year and that we want to offer it to the church. In the back, um, in the narthex, there's a table set up. You get a shoe box and you fill it up. You fill that shoe box up with anything that you can think of. You can fill it up with t-shirts. They need shoes because sometimes the kids don't have shoes. Fill it up with a cup, a toothbrush, some toys. We have a little piece of paper that tells you exactly how to pack your box. 
and the important information are highlighted. Now, Operation Christmas Child is a mission that um, is done in October because we need all the boxes returned no later than November 7th. That way, so the kids can get them for Christmas. And we have a video that's about five to six minutes long to show you more about what Operation Christmas Child is.
uses those prayers. He answers prayer. And every year we save many of the children that their family trusted in Jesus Christ. So thank you. Thank you for your help. Thank you for your support. And listen, keep praying. We need your prayers. The children of the world need your prayers. God bless you. So that is Operation Christmas Child. And I know there are some people here that have participated in Operation Christmas Child. So if you had, can you please stand? So these are some people that if you have questions about Operation Christmas Child, you can come to myself and any of the people standing because it really is a wonderful mission that we have here. So I really hope you can help participate. Thank you. Yes. Mm-hmm. We have um, a boy and a girl shoebox um, already packed in the back that you can look to see as an example of different things that you can put in there. So thank you so much. I cannot recommend this project more than any other project. It is great. It's wonderful. Gives you a feel-good feeling inside. <laughs> That's it. Okay. Now, please stand if you're able. No, it's not it either. Please stand if you're able for the litany of approach and praise. God is with us in this place. Amen. When we're feeling lost and alone, God is with us. In strange places and in between, God is still with us. Come, let us worship the God who loves us and is always with us. Please be seated. My turn? Yep. Okay. okay. My turn. I can't do this by myself. Or I could, but... Okay, first of all, can I have you stand up here because we're going to ask the congregation a question. Come on. I like your haircut. Okay. Who in this congregation was born outside the U.S. and spoke another language? Can I see hands? One, two, I know there's a third, there's three, four, okay, okay. Um, can I ask just the name of the country you were from? Jenny? Taiwan. Ingrid? Okay. Alonso? Peru? Peru? Portugal. Portugal. Okay. So you grew up speaking another language and going to school, you learned to read in another language, right? The language of your home country. Okay, do you see that? 
All right, that's the end. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Whoa. Wait a minute. <laughs> Come on back. That was just giving you an idea, okay? Now, anybody here hear about Martin Luther King? Two, three, four, five, six. Hey, you will. Trust me. Okay? Well, we're going to talk about another Martin Luther, but not King. Okay? Uh, you probably won't study this in school, but this is Martin Luther. He was born in Germany, and he spoke German, but he was a priest. And what he could do was read the Bible, and at that time, I believe it was Latin. Okay? <laughs> um, but the people couldn't read the Bible because they didn't know how to read in Latin. And I forgot my paper at the book, but uh, that's okay. I had a demonstration, really, of uh, Latin and English. Um, but the kids couldn't read it. Maybe they could read English, right? Who can read? Okay, all right. Now, if you didn't read English and you had a Bible, could you read it? No. If you didn't know German and you had a Bible in Latin, could you read it? No. How about Portugal? Spanish? Portuguese? OK. If you were in Portuguese and, you know, you had a Bible in Latin, could you read it? No. Well, this Martin Luther, he changed things. And we're going to have a whole month, I try not to bore you, but a whole month of the Bible being changed so everybody could read it. Okay? And we have children's Bibles and we have adult Bibles. But in every country, there are Bibles now written in the language that the people study in school, their native language, in Chinese, uh, Portuguese, German, Spanish. Am I right? OK, I, I get a nod over there. So if it wasn't written in English for us, would we know the story of the Bible? No. no. Uh -uh. But we go to school. We learn to read our language in English. And we have a Bible that we can read from. OK? And I want you to remember parts of this because Try not to bore you, but next week we're going to do the same thing, okay? We're going to look at that Bible, and we're going to be able to see what it says in English. And then maybe we can get a Bible in somebody else's language, huh? And we could see that, but I bet you can't read it. I'll bet anything you can't read it. So that's the story today. Not much of a story, is it? No. But we'll go on. I want you to remember, every country has a language. Kids learn in their native language. They can read. The Bible is now printed in all languages. So everybody has a chance to know the story of Jesus. Okay. That's it today. Are you going? You can go. <laughs> Come on, Alton. You, you can go now. But I want you to try and remember. Oh, did everybody remember their box for thank you God notes? Are you using your box for thank you God notes? 
Nobody? Okay. First of all, do we have any birthdays out there? Claude Mack. Bill Palmer. Have any concerns? People out there, okay. Thank you. How about that? <laughs> yeah, we might have some celebrations. <laughs> you did them last Sunday? All right. <laughs> then we didn't hear them. <laughs> okay. So does anyone have any unspoken prayer requests out there? We sure can do that. Yes, absolutely. And um, our prayer today is very befitting of those who are hit by the hurricane and affected. Healing God, we are very aware of the fact that many in this world lack the basic things that make for healthy living. Clean water, simple nutrition, access to medical supplies and personnel. We realize how fortunate we are when we are able to receive care for ailments large and small. At the same time, we think of those who do, are not even able to imagine receiving care for simple conditions. Help us to reach out to those who need care. Inspire us to give medical missions and programs here and abroad that can make such great differences. 
challenge us to speak out in defense of those who have no voice and who both need and deserve basic care. Each time we take a drink of water, may we do something to help others achieve it. Each time we take medicine for sickness or disease, make us mindful of those who cannot do that. Break down to the barriers that sometimes cause us to judge others or disregard them because of sicknesses they may have. Remind us that we are all your children and that you desire all your children to be loved and cared for. Amen. We will now receive the gifts of offering. We can sometimes become self-centered, O oh God, but when we are given offerings, we remember those, even the small, small of gifts, when pulled together, they can make huge differences in the world. So take them, take what we offer, and now use to make a difference. Let, in, in, name, in Christ's name we pray, amen. be seated. The scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Jeremiah chapter 29 verses 1 and 4 through 7. The prophet Jeremiah sent a letter from Jerusalem to the few surviving elders among the exiles to the priests and the prophets and to all the people Nebuchadnezzar had taken to Babylon from Jerusalem. The Lord of heavenly forces the God of Israel proclaims to all the exiles, I have carried off from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and settle down, cultivate gardens and eat what they produce, get married and have children, then help your sons find wives and your daughters find husbands in order that they too may have children. Increase in number there so that you don't dwindle away, promote the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile 
Pray to the Lord for it, because your future depends upon its welfare. So ends the scripture reading. And now we'll have uh, Ray Rogers and Joe Deleuze. I have trouble with that. To give your message. Thank you, David. Uh, the first speaker today is going to be uh, Joe Deluge. Um, he's uh, from Portugal, and he's going to tell about uh, a fantastic journey he took, a very trying journey, uh, to finding the Lord in his life. So, Joe, if you'll come forward, please. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Joe De Luz. The Luz means light. Uh, it is a name that the Portuguese, that were Jews, picked as a name, Portuguese name, to cover their identity. Just a curiosity of the name. Uh, I think I can control it from here, right? So um, I'm going to uh, present to you my testimony of what happened to me. So I'm going to tell you a story of what happened to me. And uh, I picked the subject, um, very important, God really exists. And. Uh, as I, I told before, I was born in Portugal, and Portugal is up north in Europe. You can see the green area. Portugal is is, is in a in the in the left side of the Europe of the continent, next to Spain and France, and the, the Portuguese. In the 15th century, adventure to go south to Africa, and they made a lot of colonies. And um, I went to Angola. Angola was one of the is the size of Texas, just to give you an idea. Um, so I went, and I'll tell you the story. So um, I went to Angola when I was 12 years old. And uh, so um, the situation started in the 60s, 15, year, 15 years after the, the Second World War. And uh, many of the countries gave the independence to, to, to the colonies, but Portugal didn't. And uh, so in 61, the Angolans, since they didn't get independence, they start fighting for independence. And uh, the Portuguese leader, Salazar, was like Mussolini in Italy, right? The, he was a fascist uh, following the, the Nazis. And uh, so he was like against giving independence. And he, he sent a large army um, to Angola 160,000 soldiers, and my, my brothers were drafted to serve in the army. So they went to Angola, and uh, my sister was uh, going to get married with the officer, uh, and uh, they wa she wanted to get married and go to Angola too. And my mother says, if you go, I'm going with you. And uh, so she went with uh, my sister to Angola. And one year later, I joined them. Because Angola was, just to give you an idea, like Florida. Uh, it was a tropical country, exactly like Florida. 
the same weather, the same plants, right? Sometimes I'm amazed to find flowers that we had there. And uh, so uh, I went. Uh, so you got an idea of where I was. I was in the south of Africa. And um, 10 years later, I was drafted to serve the army too. And uh, the, the guy on the left side, as you can see, it's me. I was uh, very thin then. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I served the, the Portuguese army, actually it was the Angolan army, in Angola. All the, my soldiers were right, uh, Africans, they were, uh, and they were um, recruited, draft from, uh, from the local cities in population. And uh, so I served for four years in the army, and I was in the south of the country. So uh, then in 73, I got out of the army, and I joined the this school, this was a commercial uh, industrial school where they teach the kids to become, uh, to have, to be electricians, to be, to have a profession. And I was a math teacher there. But the situation was that uh, um, there was the revolt, uh, even the army that came was not able to sustain they sustained for 10 years, but in 74 and 75, the career was so intense that uh, Angolans were fighting all over the place. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I have to go back, yeah. Just to give you an idea, right, the devastation you, we see that uh, in the Syria now, but uh, that's what happened um, at that time. They destroyed buildings, they destroyed everything. And my uncle, um, actually my wife's um, uh, uncle, right? uh, he, he was uh, Angolan, and uh, he was uh, part of the rebellion for independence of Angola and he was caught by the, by the guerrillas of the opposed side, and they killed him. And uh, at that time, I was inclined to stay. I was more Angolan than Portuguese uh, to stay, but when I saw my uncle being killed by uh, Angolans, I had to think it twice, and I decided that that was not really uh, my mission to be part of the Angolan movement. At the same time, I was confused. I was 23 years old, and um, the people, uh, my friends, remember I was being out of the army, of the Angolan army, and they were away from God. And at that time, they were saying, hey, you don't need God. God doesn't exist. So why bother, right? Enjoy your life. Get your girls, drink, do whatever you want, because that's what you, that's what you have. But I was not happy with that. I was, like, still confused. And... Uh, and I didn't know what to do, right, even if I should stay in Angola or not. And uh, I was uh, in Lubango. Uh, it is a small city. It was like a, a university city because uh, I was uh, in school, uh, university school. And, uh, and one of these da those days, I was, like, confused and I went for a drive, and I, met, I, I saw that church 
the that church back in 75 was all white. And uh, as you can see, you know, the, the, they painted in color and they transform it into a, a store. And they build a, a house at the back. But in, back in 75, what, it was a small church. And the, the door was open and I went inside and there was a, a small church. They had a few banks on both sides. Oh, I'm sorry. And they had a cross. And I, I went inside and I prayed. I cried to God. This goes fast. Uh, I said, I don't know, God, if you exist or not, but I need you. And I'm confused and I'm worried about this war, if I should stay or if I should leave. And, uh, and at that, that moment, the church was empty. No, no one was there. But I felt the, that uh, God was listening to my prayer and uh, nothing happened. There was no lights, nothing, right? But what I felt was a feeling of peace. And, uh, and I, I, I felt like I should leave. So I went out of the church and there was a man at the door. And uh, he was not a priest because he didn't have a color because this was a Catholic church. Uh, and, uh, and he asked me, what are you doing here? And I told him, I'm just uh, looking for guidance to know what to do. And he told me, go, but be careful. And uh, especially when you get into the border, you're going to cross at Ruakana, Ruakana uh, Falls, which is like a, a, fall, a waterfalls. And I said, no. I just didn't say anything. I just said, well, thank you for your advisement, but I'm going my way, which is uh, I'm going to take the, the, the road that is in asphalt straight to the border. And uh, I thanked him and left. And uh, so what happened was, as you can see, I was up north in Lovango. Uh, Lovango was known by the, the big cathedral. You can see the photo at, uh, at the back. And I have, I have to go south to South Africa, going um, on the right side, because this was an established road. It was uh, with a tar, right, uh, all, uh, asphalt. On a, and I could drive fast. The, the other road that the person was telling me was the road that will take me to the falls, to the falls in Roacana, which is close to the border, because Angola was higher, and then w w when it was in the border, it will go down, right? Uh, because uh, in... in uh, over here, it was a desert. And uh, so I, I was not planning to go there, but God took me there for a reason, because there was a, a guerrillas waiting for us on this road. We were about there and uh, we avoid them. And uh, so we went through the sand roads and uh, wet roads and bad roads into the Ruakana, but we went there safe. Just to give you an idea, uh, uh, my group was a group of 11 cars uh, and uh, this was the typical people trying to get 
out of the country because the country was in war. So I crossed the border and I went for about seven, seven hours until we got into Grootfontein. Grootfontein was like a, a small city close to the border, well, seven hours away. And, um, and they, had a, they had a big camp there. So I, I went to the camp. And, uh, and in that camp, there was a, a group of men there with a big truck with boxes. And uh, when I got there, one of them came to me and says, uh, can, you, can you read this Bible? It, 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 they didn't say Bible, they said this book. And they, they gave me this. And they say, hey, can you open the last page and read what is in there? And in here it was like a, an invitation to accept the Lord. And I told them, sure. And, uh, and I signed sign my name. And David, if uh, my name is really long, my name is Jose Luis Fernandez Riengo da Luz. Uh, so, well, that was my name and was the way I signed it. And this was in September 75. And what happened was the Gideons asked me to go around this camp and give the, this small Bible to the other people. So I, I spent the day going through the camp and helping them to distribute the small Bible to them. And by the way, this Bible is in Portuguese. <laughs> um, we have uh, multiple, uh, I think Ray is going to talk about that. But, uh, so my experience was that uh, a year later, uh, I joined uh, the Gideons in Pretoria, because I went south to Pretoria. It was like three days trip, because <laughs> uh, we had to stop in, in the middle. And uh, I met the Gideons in Pretoria, and uh, they asked me to distribute the Portuguese Bible through the Portuguese people, which I did for about uh, a year. And when the box finished, they gave me another box. <laughs> and, uh, so I was, uh, I became a member of the Gideons and uh, they were praying in Afrikaans and they will tell me, hey, you can pray in Portuguese, don't worry. <laughs> and uh, so uh, in for, uh, later on in 86, I came to United States and I joined uh, the Gideons in New Jersey. And I've been here in Venice uh, for two years, and I joined the, the Lemon Bay Camp, which is the camp that serves you in this area. So this is my story. This is the way I receive the Lord, and thank you for allowing me to present it to you. switch my microphone on, I guess. Then I can walk around and talk. There we go. I assume everybody can hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, the, um, I want to start off by talking about the, uh, the refugees, uh, refugees in Syria and how they've uh, come out of Syria into uh, Europe and Scandinavia and other countries and, and their plight and uh, how the Gideons have tried to uh, uh, help them come to Christianity. Um, 
So we'll start off with the uh, first uh, visual here. There we go, okay. Escaping ISIS and um, finding God's word. Uh, you're very familiar, you see it on TV uh, every other day now. It was every day uh, six months ago. Uh, but ISIS was so brutal that they were uh, beheading people, they were setting them on fire, and uh, these refugees were caught right in the middle of it, uh, just like Joe was caught in Ang Angola. And um, so this is this is a, a picture of them uh, uh, streaming out of uh, out of uh, Syria, and in uh, 2015, they were uh, re reloaded, re reloaded, uh, locating to countries where the gospel could be uh, shared. In, in Syria, it was. Um, out, outlawed. If you were passing out a Bible, uh, you could be pre prison, put in prison. You could be beheaded, um, uh, tortured. Uh, so we could, the Gideons could not get in there to, to, to pass out Bibles and and uh, teach people the Word of God and and uh, tell them about Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Um, but we had the goal, and we had a long time to get this generation the Word of God. And we've, we've looked and we've been praying uh, for a way to get to them. Um, as it says here, many, many years we've been praying for it, uh, a way to get into the Muslim countries where uh, the Bible was banned. Um, we have faithful Gideons that were across uh, Europe. Um, most of you probably think of the Gideons as the organization that put Bibles in hotels, and we're proud of that, and we do it, and we contact those Bible, those hotels every year to make sure they have fresh Bibles in there. If their Bibles are damaged, we take them back and replace them with new Bibles, and then we use the damaged Bibles in prisons. We put new covers on them, and we use them in our prison, prison ministry. Most of these people that uh, were leaving, uh, these refugees, um, had nothing with them but the clothes on their back and not a single book usually. They, they, that, books were heavy, so they weren't carrying them. Uh, and uh, through donations uh, uh, from churches like you, yours and some other sources, uh, individual Gideons gave money. Uh, we were able to raise uh, $53,000 to start printing uh, Bibles um, for these Muslims that were coming into countries where we could now reach them. And the, we saw the need to, uh, to print the, uh, the Bibles in two languages. And um, the children's lesson today um, ties right in with what we're, we're talking about. Uh, the ones going into uh, Germany, if we gave them a German Bible, uh, that wouldn't help them at all. Um, and we did have, we did have Arab, Arabic Bibles, but what we decided would be most effective would be to have a Bible that would be printed in both Arabic and the native language, whatever country they're in. So you can imagine the expense of print, printing dual language Bibles in seven or eight different languages. So, but this is how they looked. They were for us, quite expensive, four dollars a piece, approximately it cost us. And um, on one side, here's uh, Acts. Uh, Acts over here would be written in German, and on this side, it would be written in Arabic. So um, these uh, Muslims all of a sudden had a book that they, they could read. And not only could they read it, but it, it could help them learn German because they could look back and forth and see, okay, okay here's what it's, here, here's, this is what it says in Arabic. This is what it says in German. In the same way in France, in the same way in Belgium, they could uh, uh, use it as a, as a tool to learn a local language. So it, it, anyway, we had to re, uh, raise $53 million uh, to do that. And uh, we got that done in a matter of months and uh, began uh, distributing uh, these dual language uh, Bibles. Um, 
Uh, the size of, the, of this issue is, is just mind-boggling. Um, there, there were over 13 million uh, refugees coming out of these countries. And um, in uh, 2015, about 5 million of them had already been registered in Europe and Scandinavia. So it, it, uh, it was a huge number of people and a huge opportunity for us as Gideons. Um, in Austria, in um, the first three months, uh, 210 Muslim refugees applied for adult christening. So this is just uh, showing you the beginning of some of the results that have, have happened as a result of the Gideons and other Christian groups uh, getting to these m Muslim people and, and uh, having them read the Word of God and learning uh, that having a new life in Jesus Christ as, as their uh, as their Lord and Savior, and knowing that they're, they're, they're forgiven because um, Christ died on a cross for them. The Muslim re religion is very strict and very uh, brutal at times, the way they practice it. In Hamburg, yeah, there's uh, 80 ex-Muslims uh, getting baptized. Um, uh, there's a church in, in Berlin um, that had 150 members, and uh, uh, it now has 700 members, almost all of them uh, Muslim converts. So uh, the, these programs are working. Um, the, there's a tremendous uh, persecution among the um, uh, Muslims on themselves and persecuting Christians. Uh, this shows us some example. There's this, uh, a couple, uh, Amir and Rashad of Syria. They accepted Jesus Christ. They even named their baby Christina. And uh, I don't know whether you can see Christina is right there. And uh, now, now they fear the possibilities of beating and even, even death uh, by, at the hands of the relatives. So that, that's how, how brutal the, uh, the Muslim religion can be. Uh, they were living in, in the refugee camp. Uh, they got out of there before they knew they were Christians, but they knew they couldn't stay there because they weren't going to pray, pray to Allah seven times a day or whatever their custom is. So they, uh, they got out of there. Um, this is another family here. Uh, Fadi, he was a Syrian. Uh, he read um, the New Testament and uh, became a Christian after reading the New Testament and learning about uh, Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Um, his wife uh, also converted to Christianity and she's now participating in, uh, in discipleship groups. Um, her, she said about her family, they're Shi Shiites, she said, and if they knew, they were probably still back in Syria, they would kill me and we would lose our children. So um, that, that's what these people are putting up with when they convert, convert to Christianity. Um, I, I don't, I, I want, does that sound familiar to you, people being persecuted as, as Christians and, uh, and working in, secrety, secret, uh, in, in secret so they wouldn't be thrown into the lion's den? Doesn't that sound familiar? Yeah, when um, the, uh, the early Christians, they had to get out in the dirt and put a fish there, down there so they could identify themselves in, as Christians and other people wouldn't know that they were Christians. So these new Muslim converts have to be, have to work in, uh, in secret like that. Um, so they don't get uh, beaten or uh, murdered uh, because of their religion. Um, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about some of the other things uh, that, the, that the Gideons are doing. Um, uh, very quickly, we we're, we we're, uh, we work uh, in uh, Northport throughout Florida. Uh, we give out uh, testaments like this one-on-one -on -one with, with the testimony. Um, we, we had a distribution at the um, uh, Salvation Army uh, in uh, uh, Venice here and gave them um, a lot of, uh, gave, the, gave these out to people that were uh, uh, there. Um, and we give a testimony when we give them out. We have, we have them printed in, uh, in um, Russian, because there's a lot of Russian-speaking people here in Northport, and we 
distribute a lot of them in, in Russia. Uh, oftentimes there'll be a younger couple there that uh, they don't need it in Russia because they speak very good English, but they, they want it for the mother or grandmother or somebody in the household who, who really does need a, a, a Bible that's printed in um, uh, their local language. Um, we have a two minute video uh, and if we could pull that up and then I'll wrap my, my talk up very quickly. This is a talk by a gentleman by the name of Leroy Kennedy. I got involved with drugs, alcohol, uh, prostitution. I was just trying to find something to fill the void that was in my life. I thought maybe if I had more things or I had more drugs, or maybe that would be the solution, but it wasn't. There was a park similar to this right here, uh, occupied by homeless. And I remember that, that Saturday morning, I had got up early, took a couple of hits of acid, tooted some coke, and I went for a walk in that county park in Battle Creek, Michigan. Here I was, a reject from the military. My third wife and walked out on me. And I just felt there's nothing else left but to commit suicide. But then there were some men in the park that day. They was witnessing to the homeless and they were giving them these little testaments. And one of them came up to me, had a big smile on his face, and he said, do you know Jesus? And that young man, he took that little testament and he opened it, and he showed me, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I personalized that. For God so loved Leroy Kennedy, that he gave his only begotten son. Then he opened it to the book of Romans and he showed me how I can pray and ask Jesus to come into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. It was that day I prayed. I asked Jesus to forgive me. I asked him to come into my heart, clean up my life and to make me somebody. And the Lord heard that prayer, and the Lord answered that prayer. And I want you to know I was instantly healed from my dependency of drugs. And I, the rehab centers didn't do it, but when I asked Jesus to come into my life, my life was cleaned up, and I was clear-headed of the drugs. And you know, for the first time, that void that I had been carrying around all of my life, all of a sudden it was, I felt like a new person. I, I felt whole, I felt complete. So um, we hear about experiences as Gideons about that every day. Uh, there was a gentleman up in, um, near, near uh, Sarasota. When he was a young man, um, he was like uh, Leroy. He had become an alcoholic. Because of that, he'd lost his job. Uh, he'd lost his wife. He'd lost his family. And uh, he went into a um, motel with the thought of killing himself. He had a, he had a gun with him. And uh, he just fell down on the bed. And, he looked next to him and there was a nightstand there and he pulled out that nightstand and, uh, and started uh, starting reading, reading the Bible. And um, uh, he internalized it, uh, it, gave him hope. As he read more of the Bible, he, he gained, gained confidence. He saw that there was a world for him out there after all. Um, he went into a 12-step program with Alcoholics Anonymous. Anonymous. Um, 
he went to seminary and became a pastor. And uh, right now he pastors a church um, up on the south side of Sarasota, uh, has a successful church there. He has a uh, mission food bank, uh, feeds, feeds the uh, enclosed, the homeless and the hungry. So uh, because of that Gideon Bible, uh, this man was saved and is, uh, is making a tremendous cr contribution in the community up there uh, today. Um, we have other distributions here in town coming up, but uh, I'm running over on time. Uh, we uh, distribute Bibles to the military, to uh, uh, colleges, uh, high schools, uh, county fairs, uh, and um, many other, other places. Um, some of you may say, well, what, what can I do to help the Gideons? And um, the number one thing you can do is to pray for us. If you notice on that one visual, in 1910, we gave out about, uh, in that one year alone, 26,000 uh, Bibles. In 2015, we gave out uh, 86 million Bibles. And that's only made possible because of the, all the prayers we've had from churches throughout the world and for the contributions that they give, they've given us to help us uh, provide those Bibles. Uh, and uh, there's about one third of the countries that we uh, distribute Bibles in uh, where the average income, annual income, is $5,000 or less per year. So these people don't have money to buy Bibles. And so uh, we're out there, and the, the Gideons that live in those communities probably don't make much more than that either. So they don't, they don't have money to buy the Bibles themselves. So we have to buy them. So uh, we're always in need of funds to try to fill all those orders from all these, uh, all these different countries. Um, the uh, Pastor Attila came up with the idea of having a little envelope here for your faith offering, and we'll be at the uh, door, so if you, want, if you care to give something to the Gideons, uh, anything that you can spare would be great, greatly appreciated. If you, get, if you give $5, it's enough to buy one of the hotel Bibles, and uh, for $1 and a quarter, $1.25, you can give, help us purchase one, one of these testaments. And... Uh, also, if you'd like, prefer to, to give from your home uh, afterwards, this insert that's in there about the Gideons, um, it tears apart in the back and it turns into an envelope. So you can, if you want to give when you get back home, you can stick a check in here and, and send it to, to our local Gideon office. Uh, so uh, with that, I would like to, um, to close my presentation. I want to um, uh, thank uh, Pastor uh, Attila, uh, who is a tremendous supporter of the Gideons. Um, and uh, I'd like to speak, thank Patty for helping us get organized. Without Patty, we'd uh, uh, probably not know where we were going or how to get there. So uh, thank you, Patty, and uh, uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> one, one last thing. We have Gideon cards. We're going to be passing these out to you and you can um, send a greeting card, and uh, uh, it, it gives you a chance in there to dedicate Bibles in, in the name of different people. So thank you very much. All right, would you mind standing and singing, Here I Am, Lord?
Before the blessing, I want to make sure that everybody that is a member of this congregation stays for the meeting afterwards. Go forth in peace to live your lives to the fullest. Whenever you find yourself, know that God is there with you and, will t and, and in that place try to do your best to go know God and know God will bless you every day. Amen. Mm -hmm.